Oh. So uh, we're going to finish again now by just talking more about the, uh, this amazing immune system we have, the adaptive uh, immune system. As I said on Friday, this is, is really an astonishing uh, recognition system that just plays a, a key role in us being able to survive in this world that's full of bacteria and yeast and um, fungi and viruses and parasites. There are things just all the time are trying to, to do us in and the reason we don't succumb is because we have this amazing immune system. And there are several features about it which I summarized the other day. One is its diversity. It's, it's, it's this incredible ability to recognize uh, uh, entities uh, including things that are synthesized in a lab that have never been seen on Earth before. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing in terms of that uh, side of it. And at the, coupled with this is this incredible specificity. And as I indicated the other day, for example, if, if it was seeing a, um, a benzene ring with a methyl on it, it might be able to recognize this, but it could tell the difference from having the methyl over here. It's got that level of, of uh, sophistication. Um, in spite of that, in spite of the fact that it can recognize everything else, it's able to avoid self-recognition. Which is a bit of a trick if you think about it, that you have a system that's able to see essentially anything, including things that were never existed before, then how does it avoid seeing all of our molecules and all the many, many things that, that make us up? So it has to be able to tell self from self. And then I also talked about this memory aspect of the immune system, that if you get exposed to a virus or a, or a, a bacterium or something, that the first uh, immune response is relatively weak, but then if you get subsequently uh, exposed, you get a very powerful response, and that's the principle of a vaccine. If you think someone is going to be exposed to chicken pox, but they haven't had it, if you can somehow elicit the initial response without making them sick by using a killed virus or, a ten or something like that, I mean, polio is one of the examples you hear about in the paper right at the moment. Um, then if someone does finally encounter that virus or that bacterium, the, because that's a second response, it's very quick and it's very powerful, and that's what vaccines are all about. So the, the issue, I guess, today is how does that happen? And it's, this is one of these amazing insights into biology that's come by an application of all these tools of recombinant DNA and sequencing and all the fancy sort of things we've been talking about in the past, uh, past few lectures. So the first part uh, thing I need to let you know is that there are two parts to this immune uh, response. Uh, there are two kinds of responses. One's called the humoral response and one's called the cellular response. And this takes place in the plasma of your blood. So in the, in the liquid part of the blood, if you spin down the red cells and the white cells, what you're left with is, uh, um, is the plasma. And the, uh, what this um, humoral response does, it's able to target uh, bacteria, viruses, proteins, Recognition is done by a kind, special kind of protein called antibodies, and I'll tell you about that uh, in just in just a moment because they're uh, a very important class of, of protein in this uh, in this earth. And the cell, the cellular immune response is carried out by a special kind of white white blood cell.
I'll probably, for this lecture, I think I'll just abbreviate those as WBH if I need it. And what this targets is not the actual pathogen itself, but it targets cells that are infected with a virus or a bacterium, et cetera. And that's, that might seem to be even a little bit more of a trick. It's, probably, it's hard enough probably to figure out how to take something that's floating, an entity like a virus that's floating around your blood and figure out how to stick it, something, find something that binds to it. What do you do if the thing's gone into one of your own cells and it's hiding out there in there, replicating in the same way that a that let's say a phage does or something like that. How do you see one of your own cells that's been infected by something like that? And there's a special type of cell called a cytotoxic T cell that's very important, it's often abbreviated as that. So let me first say a word about antibodies. These are proteins that consist of four, four, four polypeptide chains. Two of the chains are bigger, so they're called heavy chains. There's two of those, and there are two chains that are smaller, so those are usually called light chains. So there's four of them all together, and ignoring secondary structure and stuff for the moment, uh, let me just sort of give you an idea of how these are laid out. These are the two heavy chains. Here, and these are joined together by disulfide bridges. You remember disulfide bridges? If you had two cysteines, they can form a covalent bond between them under oxidizing conditions. So those heavy chains are locked together. They're actually physically joined, covalently joined. And then there's uh, the light chains are here. So this is the light and this part up here is, is highly variable between different antibodies and the part down here is constant between um, antibodies. And it's this huge amount of variability that that's, uh, the body is producing. It produces many, 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 many types of antibodies and then figures out which ones will work to find the particular uh, entity it's trying to recognize. And I'll come back and, and tell you in a moment how, that, how that's done. I just want to... So there is a diagram of what I, I showed you, but of course this is a pro these are proteins. They have uh, three-dimensional structures, and so if you were to look at them with the uh, primary and secondary, excuse me, excuse me, with the secondary structure shown, you can see the different um, uh, um, especially here. A lot of beta sheets should be leaping out at you. Now the part where the recognition is done is up at this end, so it's essentially right here. And this, here's a little movie. You, you can just, you can see the, how the thing looks in three-dimensional space. And you see the part that's over on the left at the moment, that's the light chain and the, uh, and the blue chain, or, or that part of the heavy uh, chain complex with the light chain. And here is, it's been tilted up this way. So this is the yellow and blue part you were looking at. And the recognition pocket is right at the end of that. And in this picture, it's showing how a piece of a, just a, a particular protein, uh, the one shown in red, uh, this antibody has learned to, or this is an antibody that can very, very precisely recognize that particular protein. You can't really tell it from the uh, three-dimensional uh, shape shown on the left because it just shows the secondary structure. But if you could see the full space-filling model, You'd be amazed at just how these surfaces are absolutely complementary. It goes back to one of those principles I've said over and over and over again, that so much of biology works by having complementary surfaces. And there's a little 
movie, you can see how this thing is sitting up there at the top. So what uh, these antibodies are produced by a special type of what are called B cells. These are cells that play roles in the immune, in the, in the humoral, remun, humoral part of the immune response. And they're called plasma cells. And each plasma cell makes one particular antibody. And that's it. So you have many different types of plasma cells, but each one only expresses one particular gene that encodes one particular antibody. So for years, this is something that people struggled with, just conceptually, that could sort of calculate that there were so many antibodies out there that if your entire genome was nothing but antibody genes, we still wouldn't have enough DNA to account for all the this ability to recognize things. So some other principle had to be uh, involved, and there were all sorts of speculations about, uh, about what it was. Um, I had shown you, I'd managed to not get Bob Horvitz's thing on here, but um, this, this then is, the, who is our fourth Nobel laureate, I've been sort of working through these. Uh, Susumo uh, Tanagawa, who uh, was, is, in the cancer center, he's uh, and in the biology department. He's also heading now this uh, PicoR Center of Learning and Memory. So since doing this work, I've t I'm telling you about on the immune system. He's gone on to um, to do some wonderful stuff uh, over on more on the uh, big problem of how how we learn and how trying to get more molecular insights into that into that process. But what um, Susumo managed to, f to figure out was that these, the vari this variation and diversity in the immune system happens, uh, has at its roots a combinatorial sort of process. So if you look in the DNA of a zygote, so that's the, the fertilized egg. So we're just getting started with one of our uh, say one of our uh, cells, uh, got a, a single cell, and we're looking in the DNA to see what would happen. We come to the part of the DNA that's involved in producing antibodies. What uh, he found was that if you looked along the DNA, there were sequences that looked like part of the stuff you find in antibodies, but there were a whole series of them. So he called this particular segment, like V1, V2, V3, up to Vn, there were a whole set of these basically side by side by side by side. There are about 300 of these in humans. And then down the DNA a little bit, he found another set of sequences. They're all variations of each other. And these were given D1, D2, D3, D4, up to D say M, and there are many of these. And then down the DNA a little farther, there were three other sections that were called joining segments, and they were called G1, J1, J2, and J3. And a little bit farther down was a block of DNA encoding a constant part of the uh, of this polypeptide chain that goes into an antibody. And what uh, Susumu Tanagawa was able to show, and this led to the Nobel Prize, that what, ha what happens uh, during uh, the development of these B cells is that there are rearrangements and a lot of DNA is thrown around. And the basic strategy is to take, if you think of this as being column A, you take one from column A, one from column B, just picking them randomly, and one from column C over here, and throw away everything else. So you might have, for example, in one B cell, you 
you might have V32, D15, J2, and then the constant region. And what's in between is an intron that will be spliced out at the time that the gene's expressed. In another B cell, you might have you know, V11, D22, J3. So this rearrangement is random, I mean random in the sense of which V segment is, is chosen, which D segment is cho chosen, and which J segment. I don't mean that it just all joins together in, uh, in a completely <laughs> uncontrolled way. And then the rest of the DNA is deleted. So the consequence of this is each B cell expresses only one antibody. It's true that they're diploid, but only one chromosome expressed. So that's how they avoid uh, avoid make, making, you could imagine they, they might make, make two, but they only make, make one. And the process is, uh, as you can see, that part is random. Furthermore, the joining events are what we, I think you could call sloppy. And this leads to even more variation than you would have imagined from simply looking at the number of segments. So what this part of the process does is it explains why this system can be, it has the diversity it has because, because it's using this combinatorial process, you can calc if you know the number, you guys could figure out how many possible combinations there are. But then in, there's much more variation because when it joins together, sometimes the, plim the, the little segments that are joined are done in a sloppy way so that the, the DNA sequence that shows up at where the joints occur uh, doesn't look like anything that was in the DNA at all. It was, say, a, uh, something like a polymerase that wasn't very faithful copying and making mistakes as it went along. So what this system does is it doesn't get you a response. It just explains why there is so much diversity, why it is I can go into the lab and synthesize a compound that's never been on this earth before and in, inject a rabbit to it, and the rabbit will probably produce an antibody that's able to recognize that. That's because it's made this whole set of them, and they all are going to have somewhat different surfaces, and it, they make so many that just one of those surfaces is going to fit the molecule that I'm, that I'm testing. But you can sort of see that's only <laughs> part of the, the trick. So how, how do you now get an immune response? Because you've got millions of these, uh, these things, but what you need is now a whole lot of one particular antibody that's going to recognize the pathogen that you're, you're, uh, you're, you're uh, being exposed to. And the principle uh, of that is really cute. It's called a a process called clonal selection. And the idea is that each B cell displays sample of its antibody on its surface. So 
we might think of it this sort of way, that after this process is through, we have um, one uh, B cell. These are, of course, these are way out of proportion. The cells would be huge, and these would be molecules, so they're small. But here would be an antibody that can recognize squares. Let's say this one would have an antibody that could recognize triangle. This one would have an antibody that could recognize a semicircle, and so on. Millions and millions of, of, of different shapes. And these cells don't divide, though. They've been made, and they just sit there. And then when you stimulate them with an, an antigen, and I used, I used that word the other day, an antigen is just anything that will elicit an immune response. It could be a piece of a foreign protein, a carbohydrate, uh, just, just about anything that a small molecule you've made in the lab. But let's say we expose now this individual to, oh, I'll run it upside down, to an antigen, which in this case can fit into that uh, receptor. Okay, what happens then, this one becomes stimulate to divide. So what we have now is this, this B cell that has this antigen stuck into its, into its binding pocket on, on the sample of its, its antibody. And then the, the cells divide, and they give rise to two populations. They give rise to the plasma cells, which are very short-lived. of the order of a few days. And what these do, so they, they would look like, like this. And what they do is secrete antibodies into the plasma. So what you end up with then are a lot of these antibodies that have exactly the specificity that uh, that the um, original um, sample had on the outside of that particular B cell. This takes a few days. So back when we were talking about the discovery of DNA, I was telling you about Streptococcus pneumonia, and that you get infected by a, uh, uh, the Streptococcus, and there'd be this period of five or six days where uh, the person was very sick, and then either they'd survive or they didn't survive. Uh, if they survived, they'd been able to make to mount an immune response and make these antibodies before they got killed by the bacterium. And the reason it takes a few days is when you start out in the limit, there could be just one B cell that's able with an antibody, makes an antibody that's capable of recognizing that capsule. Or maybe there were a few anyway, but they were very, very tiny number and there were probably a lot of bacteria. So what had to happen then is that that original cell or small number of cells that could recognize the streptococcus had to be amplified. They had to make a lot of plasma cells that, that had the potential to make that antibody. And then they had to secrete the antibody into the, uh, into the plasma. And I'll tell you in just a minute some of the strategies how that, that uses to help um, kill, the, kill the, the pathogen. But the other population, just before I go on there, are are mem what are called memory cells. There's not as many of these made, but they're very long-lived. And so uh, what they have is exactly the same capacity to make the, uh, to make the same, the capacity to make the same antibody, but they're not actively dividing. They'll just sit there, uh, float around in your, in your bloodstream. And then if you get a second exposure to the antigen, you get a very fast and strong response because the, the selection for finding 
uh, cells that have antibodies that can recognize the antigen has already been done, and there's already a few of them around. And then after you do that, then you're able to make, uh, once again, the binding of the antigen stimulates these guys to start dividing. They make a lot of plasma cells. And that's the principle, when I'm going back to the principle of vaccination, that your first response is fairly modest, but if you get a second response, what you're doing now is you, the memory cells are already there. They have the specificity for recognizing the antigen in question, and you can make uh, a whole lot of them. So if you had chicken pox and you were little, you have memory cells that know how to recognize the chicken pox virus. And then when your, your kid gets chicken pox, like mine did, I didn't get sick because I had memory cells that were able to um, recognize that. Okay, um, so what happens uh, if you get the, an antibody, how does it, how does this, uh, help the, the organism, or the, in our case, uh, someone like you or me, avoid getting sick? So there are a couple of strategies. One we might think of as bind and block. For example, you have your virus, and you get covered by antibodies. Viruses, it's exactly the same logic as a bacteriophage, except that instead of affecting a bacterial cell, a virus would be infecting one of our cells. And if, if the virus has receptors or something, and it has, it has, it has to find, recognize something on my cell in order to, to attach and then inject its, its DNA. So if uh, we've got an antibody sitting here, then it can't find its way to the host cell. That's one way. And then there are a couple of other, um, other ways. They can target for destruction. And there's, there's basically two ways here. Something called the complement system. That if it is able to recognize, uh, say, a bacterial cell and their antibodies are sticking to the outside, what the complement system does is it's able to make little pores in the membrane of the pathogen. And I think one of the things I hope you remember was that one of the secrets to life was we have to keep that membrane around there. We have to keep all of our insides in and the rest of the world outside. And we have hydrogen ion gradients across that membrane. So if you want to kill a cell and you say insert a, a protein that makes a little, has a little hole in it and that thing sits and sticks in the membrane, that cell is dead. It can't maintain an ion gradient and things can leak out through the hole. So that's one of the ways of killing it. And the other ways are um, macrophages. These are a type of, of white blood cell as well, are very good at recognizing bacteria that have uh, antibodies stuck to the outside. And in fact, that was the, the principle of that. We had the streptococcus, and we have the capsule, and you re may remember that little movie I showed of a, of a white blood cell that was trying to eat it and it just couldn't get hold of the thing, whereas we saw another example where a bacterium without a capsule, there was the sort of principle I said is that the, the white blood cell is able to recognize the bacterium and then it pinches it off inside of a membrane bubble and I sort of said at least in principle, then there's another little bubble with poisons and it brings it together so that you have the bacterium and the poison together inside of some intracellular compartment. So the macrophages know how to kill a, a bacterium if they bring it inside. The problem in the case of something like streptococcus was, um, was being able to recognize it because it couldn't get hold of that capsule. So those antibodies that got made during that five-day thing decorate the outside of the capsule because their specificity is to recognize the, 
the, the capsule and bind to it. But a macrophage, even if it couldn't get hold of, of the bacterium uh, with, with the capsule, is able to ingest something that has antibodies stuck on the outside. And once it gets inside, it can kill, it can kill the bacterium. In fact, immunologists call these, this process opsonization, which is uh, derived from the Greek words for seasoning, like putting salt on your food. And the idea was that when they were giving that word was these macrophages, which like to eat bacteria that have a little seasoning, that they have these little antibodies decorating their, their outsides. So here you can see, at least in the humoral immune response, how you generate a whole lot of diversity, then this principle of what's called clonal selection identifies a B cell that's able to make an antibody that can recognize the particular pathogen or molecule you're being exposed to, amplify that, make a lot of antibodies, and then it can either just stick to the pathogen like a virus and mess it up that way, or it can decorate it if it's something like a bacterium and then pull in a couple of other systems that are capable of killing the, the pathogen. I mean, it's an absolutely amazing system. Um, it sounded like science fiction when I first heard about it. And when I heard people talking about it, everyone could see there was an information theory problem. How do you encode all that information with just this, this amount of DNA in a cell? And now we understand it. And there's even another part that I'm leaving out here. But once this whole thing has been selected, there's another whole round of sort of refinement where the cells do kind of a very kind of localized mutagenesis, one base pair at a time in the vicinity of this binding pocket. And they're able to make, if they given more time and more exposure to the antigen, they can make a better and better binding surface to get to the, you know, begin to approach sort of the, the theoretical maximum. Now this, the T cell, uh, In this case, um, this involves the cytotoxic T cells, and they have a specific recognition uh, recognition molecule on their surface. It's called the T-cell receptor. And in this case, it's attached. So this is the membrane of the T-cell. And there are, um, there's a little piece that sticks it. This is the cytoplasm down on this side. There's a little bit of the protein that goes uh, into that. And then there's an alpha helix that goes through, and then a segment that comes up like this. And there's another chain that does the same thing. So there are two segments that span the membrane. This thing is anchored in the membrane. And then it's essentially the same principle as with antibodies. There's a variable region, and there's a constant region. And to a first approximation anyway, the logic by which the cell generates a huge diverse set of T cell um, uh, receptors is the same logic that underlies the generation of a whole lot of different antibodies by taking segments, joining them, picking them randomly out of column A and column B, and then joining them together, sloppy joining, and all the other processes to increase the pool of diversity. Now, what these uh, B cells are able to do then these T cells are able to do is something quite remarkable, though. We have on our cells, this is, say, one of my cells, little sort of proteins that function as sort of display cases or something. And what they do is they show samples of all of the different proteins that are inside us at any given moment. There's a, proteins are turned over and chopped up and con things are recycled and so on. So there are always little peptides, little pieces of proteins around. And the 
display case, if you will, is called the, it's got a major major histocompatibility complex, which is usually abbreviated as MHC because it's such an unwieldy name. And, you could, and there are many, many alleles of, of MHC in the population, which means that we each have, for the most part, are sort of individually uh, designed display cases for showing these peptides. The property of these display cases, they take some little piece of a protein, just a few amino acids long, it binds into the display case, and that sticks on the outside of our cell. And so we have a lot of these. So on the surface of all of our cells are these little individualized MHC display cases showing little samples <laughs> of the peptides that are, of the proteins, from the proteins that are inside us. So if everything's fine, all of the peptides that are in the display cases are our own. And I'll tell you in a minute why that doesn't cause a problem. But then if you get infected by a virus and it injects its, its, uh, its DNA or its RNA inside you and then starts to replicate, now you have some virus proteins that don't belong to you. They get chopped into pieces and they begin to appear on these histo major histocompatibility display cases. So if we think here, this could be perhaps a little piece of a, let's call it a self protein. Could be a little piece of my own DNA polymerase or something like that. And over in this one, let's say we have a little piece of a viral protein. So that's something that not, would not be normally there. So what this T cell receptor does is it recognizes, so this is non-self or foreign. What the T cell receptor does is it recognizes these foreign peptides, but it does it in the context of the display case. So it doesn't, otherwise the peptides would be floating around. So in essence, the T cell receptor, if this is a cytotoxic T cell, is able to see the individual display case with the bit of viral protein in it. And then it knows that it should kill that cell because it's got something in it that shouldn't be there. I mean, it's a, it's a brutal but very effective strategy. If we applied it here, I'd go around, if, if I found any of you had a cold, you know, I could detect, I'd just take a gun and shoot you. And it would cut down on the number of, you know, sick days for the rest of us because it wouldn't spread <laughs> the infection. But in essence, at a molecular level, that's, that's the strategy. Try to identify a protein that's got, uh, a cell that's got something inside it that shouldn't be there, and then the cytotoxic T cells kill that. And let me just show you a couple of, of quick movies of this. Just to, at this point, these will be the last protein structures you're going to see from me, I think. Um, here's a representation of that T cell just in, as a cartoon, as you'd see it in a textbook. Here it is. Uh, this is the binding pocket up here. And there's a little tiny uh, peptide, nine amino acids from the HIV virus bound in there. Somebody did a crystal structure and was able to work that out. And um, if you look at it in three dimensions, you'll see how, how beautifully there's this little binding pocket and the peptide lies in there. And that's, so that red part is the piece of chalk and the other part is what I'm describing as my hand. It's not a bad analogy actually, even on a, on a structural level. And then here's another representation. Here's, this is sort of showing the hand with the piece of peptide in it and then the T cell is able to see this whole thing and recognizing it, recognize it. And if you look at it in a structural form, here's the, here's the uh, little peptide. This is the part 
the display case you're just looking at, and here is the T cell receptor now fitting down and seeing the peptide in the context of this major histocompatibility antigen. And again, these things are all beautifully complementary at the three-dimensional level. Again, at the heart of this is this principle of complementary surfaces uh, fitting together that's, that underlies so much biology. What's this? This is a tumor cell. And these are cytotoxic T cells that have recognized that this tumor cell is doing something that it shouldn't, that a normal cell wouldn't do, and it's attacking it and it's killing them. So not only do these, uh, this, this cellular immune response help us with the, against things like infections from virus and, and, um, and bacteria, it also will help prevent cancer. So there's, obviously there must be some trick here to when we, why we don't see our, our own peptides. And this is the self versus non-self. And it's a relatively simple principle. So distinguishing self versus non-self is a problem throughout this whole part of the immune system. And, and here's the principle. In, during embryogenesis, the, the, the cell makes, or the, the organism, I guess, <laughs> makes the assumption. I mean, obviously not is not thinking about it. This is a way of understanding what's happening. Makes it the assumption that no pathogens are present. Any B or T cell Recognizing something must be recognizing itself. And so it deletes those B and T cells. This process is given a name. It's called education. <laughs> and it happens in this organ called the thymus. So, and then after birth, then it switches. And now B and T cells If they recognize something, the body makes the assumption it must be a pathogen and it goes after it. We have a few disease, human diseases that, where that goes awry. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis are cases where the self versus non-self recognition has broken down case of, for example, multiple sclerosis, a very difficult disease because there's a gradual deterioration of the, of the uh, nervous system. And what happens is your body, of the person with that, mounts an immune response against the, the sheath that covers the nerves. And then that sheath gets destroyed and then the nervous system, somebody with multiple sclerosis, starts to, to break down. And so if you, if you lose this self versus self, you get what's called an autoimmune disease. You may have, you may have heard that, that phrase. It's very, very important. It's a very tough thing if you have one of these things, but that's what lies at the heart of it. And w people still don't know, but there's certainly some evidence for some of these. They're triggered by a bacterial infection. So it could be that perhaps maybe a bacterial protein looked close enough to one of your own proteins that somehow you got antibodies against the bacterium, and then it turned out it could also recognize something in your body. There are some other immune diseases you probably heard of, the, the baby in a bubble kind of thing. There's, there are a few uh, people who are born who have no immune 
response at all because one of the basic pieces for doing that, those DNA gymnastics that I talked about isn't there. Those people have no B cells or T cells and they die unless they're um, absolutely shielded from everything else. And that's one of those cases where you know, gene therapy, if you could get that gene into that person, then they, they'd have an immune system and they could live. There are other kinds of immune deficiencies that are less extreme but nevertheless, people will be susceptible to infection. The other one, which we've already talked about, but now you can see in another context, is AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And I told you how what the AIDS virus does is it injects its RNA, that makes a DNA copy, it goes into your protein. The cells that it affects are a special type of T cell called T helper cells. The, what they are doesn't matter so much, but what's important to know is they're needed for both branches of the immune system. They, they play roles in, in the humoral response and the cellular response. So someone who, who gets infected with HIV, what happens is the virus is replicating in these helper T cells, and so their immune system is just slowly, slowly being knocked away. And the last thing, which I won't have time to talk about, if you have an allergy, that's an overreaction of the immune system. So um, I have to, this is my last lecture, I gotta let you guys go. Uh, it's been a true pleasure to talk to, uh, talk to you, a uh, real honor to meet many of you, and I, many of you put a lot of effort into those little answers. I really, really appreciate that. For those of you who'd rather not be here, I hope that somewhere down the line when you're confronted with a medical situation, dealing with your parents, your child, yourself, whatever it is, that some of this stuff that you've heard will reemerge to be to help you uh, with those decisions and I wish you the best of luck with the rest of the course and with uh, your the rest of your careers at MIT and beyond thanks very much and, and as I as I leave too I've, I've had the pleasure of having just an incredible teaching staff I don't think you guys know how hard they work behind the scenes but thanks to all of you for for being with me